Faith for Today with Colin Urquhart and Julia Fisher. The parable of the lost son, as told by Luke, we're looking at the kingdom of God, and this is one of the parables that Jesus told. Again, Colin, we have to really get under the skin of these stories to fully understand them, don't we? Yes, uh, this is often known as the parable of the prodigal son. Here in the NIV, it's called the parable of the lost son. I th- I think it's unfortunate, uh, these titles, because really the central character in this parable is the father. It's uh, a parable about a father who had two sons. And... Um, Both the sons acted in wrong ways, but it's what the father does in relation to them that is the real key. Now, yesterday, we we looked at um, the parable of uh, of um, the Good Samaritan, and we saw that that's a parable about putting the life of the kingdom that God has put within us, putting the love of the Holy Spirit that He has given us as believers into action that it's not a question of saying we love people, we have to put love into action. And I was making the point that this is what God expects. It is not enough for people to make some kind of act of commitment to God or to say that, uh, you know, I have been saved because I've given my life to Jesus. What God then expects is for us to live the life of his kingdom here on earth. And we will be judged, not as to whether we have received the life of the kingdom or not, but whether we live the life of the kingdom. Because Jesus says that we will, everyone will be judged according to what he has done. So uh, the question for every born-again believer on the day of judgment will be, have you lived the life of the kingdom while you have been on earth? Because Jesus taught us to pray, may your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know, how, in what way have you lived the life of the kingdom? Have you done that by practically loving God, by loving others? And um, so this parable is also about the present reality of the kingdom and how we live in the life of the kingdom now. Now, it's in two distinct parts. What the younger son does and then what the older son does. So we'll look at it in two parts. We'll read the first part uh, now. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Now, let me just pause there. The father is the one who owns the inheritance of the sons. Now, when we become born-again believers, we become sons of God, and we have an inheritance We are co-heirs with Christ. So the first thing that we need to understand is that when the son comes and asks for his inheritance, the father gives it to him because it is his inheritance. So if we as Christians have a rich inheritance with our father in heaven, we need to come and ask for it and use that inheritance in the right way while we are here on earth. It's not just well, we will have an inheritance when we get to heaven. No, there is, we are already co-heirs with Christ right now. And so the first thing that this parable teaches us is that when one of the sons comes to his father and asks for the inheritance, he gives it. Now, I've heard preachers say the father was unwise to give his son the inheritance because he was... Um, obviously going to misuse this inheritance. But, you know, people that talk like that just totally misunderstand God. They don't understand, really, the the nature of God or the love of God. You cannot accuse God of being unwise because he is wisdom. But he is faithful to his promises. And if he has given an inheritance, then he has given that inheritance. And whoever lays claim to that inheritance will receive that inheritance. And if you think about it, 
uh, the first part of our inheritance is the new birth, is the life and power of the Holy Spirit, is the gift of the kingdom God has already given us. Are you telling me that God should not give his Holy Spirit to anyone if, unless they're going to live perfectly, unless they're going to perfectly obey the will of God in their lives? If God was to do that, then nobody would ever receive anything from him. God, in investing his life in allowing Christ to come to live in us by the power of the Spirit, knows full well that many of us are going to abuse his presence, we're going to misuse his gifts, we're going to sometimes ignore his presence and ignore his gifts and still going on living in our own strength. But God has still decided to invest himself in us. It just makes the point that these stories are so familiar, but you still need revelation to get to the real depth of the meaning, don't you? Yes, I mean, I felt when we were talking about the... Um, Good Samaritan yesterday, we hardly scratch the surface of of what is contained in that uh, parable. You know, that um, the, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, always did things in a very flamboyant way. If they were giving to the poor, they wanted everybody else to know what they were doing so that they would be applauded and well thought of. But here is this Samaritan, this outcast, who does this very secretly and very privately. He just looks after the man and pays for him to be cared for. Uh, there's no flamboyance, there's no look at what I've done, there's no parading his good works in front of other people. He just quietly gets on with it. And it's still true today that some people do all kinds of good charitable things for others, but they want others to know about it. They want applause, they want appreciation, they want recognition. Well, that's doing things out of wrong motive, not right motive. Because if you do a thing out of love and out of real compassion, then you do it because of your concern for the other person, not because you want recognition or you want applause from people for what you have done. So getting back to this parable of the prodigal son or of the, the two sons, the father and the two sons, um, the father gives the inheritance. So every one of us must understand that this is why Jesus said, ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Because, you see, we have an inheritance that we can take hold of because we belong to Christ and are made one with him once we are born again, once we are have entered into the salvation of God. Anyway, let's just read on in the parable. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Let's just pause there again. Because, you see, this young son has received his inheritance, but he squanders it. Why? Because he uses it on himself, not to love other people. He goes off the rails. He goes off the rails, but the reason why he goes off the rails is because his whole attitude towards life is to please himself and is to live for himself. Now, if we belong to the kingdom of God, if we're living the life of the kingdom, then we're living for God and therefore we're living for others. To love and to bless others, to encourage and to reach out to others. We are not living for ourselves. And you see what Jesus says is, if we live for others, we will ourselves be blessed. If we give, we will get good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. We will not actually be the losers of li by living for others. We will gain infinitely more. Because if you live for yourself, you lose everything. And this is what happened to this man. He lost everything. Now, there's lots of very wealthy people that live for themselves. But actually, in the end, they will lose everything. You know, it's a common saying, you can't take it with you. But they actually will not have eternal life either because they have just lived for themselves to please themselves. So they are, uh, you know, living a godless life and will have a godless eternity. But um, here with this, this is a son. 
This is a parable about the kingdom of God. It's not talking about somebody in the world. It's talking about a son of the father. So he squanders, he wastes all the riches of the inheritance that he has been given. And he ends up with nothing in the very depths of depravity, really. And remember, this is a, a Jewish son who ends up feeding pigs that are totally unclean to a Jew. They have nothing to do with pigs. He really hit rock bottom. So he hit rock bottom. But what happens? Well, it says in verse 17, when he came to his senses, when he remembered that he is a son, that he has a father, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. Now it's interesting, you see, this is true repentance. Jesus says that to be part of the kingdom, we must repent and believe. But repentance is a way of life. It's, it means to turn to God. And you have to keep turning to God. Now, he turned away from the Father. Now he's turning back to the Father, and he's deciding to go back to the Father. But his recognition is that his main sin is not his sin against the Father, but his sin against God. I have sinned before heaven and before you. I have abused the inheritance that the Father gave me. And tomorrow we'll see what the Father does in response. You've been listening to Faith for Today, presented by Julia Fisher. This program is sponsored by Kingdom Faith. For further information, visit our website, kingdomfaith.com. 